4K TV. Uh, the model on the TV is a P as in Paul 502. U as in unicorn. I as in igloo. Dash B as in boy. One echo. Okay, and the problem we're having with this TV is that the TV, uh, of course, when you plug it in, it, it, bo it boots up with the white light. The white light goes away. That means it's ready for you to actually turn the power on via the remote or the button. And when you hit the button, the, white, the light turns white, and then the picture should come in or the backlight should light up. Uh, I did check everything. I checked the voltages on the main board. I'm sorry, power supply board. I checked the voltages on... This uses a separate driver board, okay? This is a really nice television, really nice configuration. Uh, as you can see, this is edge lit. So they have the four different lines, which has lots of plugs on it. Each of those are going into the TV, okay? These are all the backlight um, plugs. And then we have a plug going from the main board, which actually controls the backlights, okay? As far as the dim and as far as the uh, 3D also and there's also a plug here coming from the power supply so i checked all that i got both just here i do remember checking the leds i, I think that was okay and but unfortunately this plug right here is not marked okay now this plug here is marked on the power supply board okay so no big deal and i'm just using it for training purposes i'm not really going to fix it today i'm going to talk about the eprom okay and how you should check that um so I one thing about this main board, this main board, as you can see, this big hefty heat sink on here. So it really has a lot of features. It also has five HDMI um, inputs. I want to talk about the uh, EEPROM. Okay, so I, I, was going to, I, I was actually going to order the EEPROM, I'm sorry, the main board, and I seen that there was a problem with the EEPROM. Okay, there were a bunch of leaks, a bunch of links on ordering just the EEPROM made specifically for this board. Okay, so. I did do that, and before it got here, I decided to actually check the EEPROM, and what I'm going to find out towards the end is going to mess you up completely, right? It's going to make you say, hmm. Okay, before I so really interrupt it. Um, damn, people called me on Sunday asking me about a damn beef sandwich. That's crazy. But anyway, um, this is the microprocessor I see, and the EEPROM is usually located near the microprocessor. It's usually an 8-pin chip like this, okay? And it usually starts with the number, the part number 25, okay? Now, I just want to make a note of this. The rest of these little 8-pin chips, which you can see, are usually a little smaller. I hope you can see this on my camera, because I said okay. Okay, um... A little smaller, and you most likely buy the plug right here. And if they're next to a coil, those are regulated chips. Okay, those are DC to DC step up or step down regulator regulator ICs or buck ICs, or what they call them. Okay, uh, I'm going to do a video on that later. But this case, we're going to go over the EEPROM, which you can see is a little bit wider than those buck IC chips. Okay, and like I said, it's usually located right next to the main microprocessor I see which is one of the heat sink and basically what it does it takes data from here via a clock signal which is produced by this crystal right here okay and that's how it reads and um, basically stores the data for the particular device and the microprocessor says this for instance you say hey um, you know you hit the, you hit the, power, you hit the, you hit the volume button and the micro says hey Got to hit the volume button. What do I need to do? So the EEPROM would then say, hey, send this code right here. Take it, spread it around the main board, and what's going to happen is the volume bar is going to come up, and also the actual volume is going to come up also. Okay, so basically that's what that does. And it, 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 then after it does that, it has to cease, hold, or stop in order for, you, for the TV to, you know, resume playing, without the volume going all the way up to the max thing, right? Okay, so basically that's, that's what it's doing. It's, 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 it's like a brain cell for a brain, pretty much. That's the best way I can explain it, okay? Okay, so I just put up the data sheet on this EEPROM, 
And this is the part number of the EEPROM, the W25Q64FB. Actually, I had a uh, few more letters on, on mine. I think mine was a JVS1Q. Uh, the 64 stands for a 64 megabits of memory, just like an SD card, okay, which has, you know, 2 gigabytes or 8 gigabytes or 32 gigs or whatever. Okay, so that's how much information is stored into it. And they actually call this a serial flash memory, okay, with dual, quad, and SBI. And that's another way that you can tell if you're looking on your circuit board for the EEPROM. It usually has SPI up under it, which stands for serial, peripheral, 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 peripheral interface, okay? I hope I'm saying that right. Okay. Now let's go ahead and look at the pinout on the EEPROM. I'm just going to show you a few pins that uh, you need to check to make sure that it is actually working. So this is the actual pinout of mostly all EEPROMs, okay? So if you want to check pin 8 using the BCC, that's the voltage coming from, you know, the power supply being converted to the 3.3 volts that it usually needs. Okay, this, this is the actual 3-volt EEPROM. Okay, the CS pin is what actually triggers the EEPROM into either uh, receiving or giving out data. Based on concern with the CS pin, the BCC, okay, the data input, which is pin 5, and the data output, which is pin 2. Okay, the W is for write protect, okay, and this is the whole function. Um, so the EEPROM doesn't keep, you know, keep telling the TV to turn on or turn off. Now, if I go down here, it should give me a basic layout of what each pin is assigned for. Pin number one, chip select. Okay, that is actually what's going to, like I said, that's going to start and stop the information from being processed on, in the EEPROM. Okay, and let's see, data output, okay, and what else did I say? Data input, coming from the microprocessor. And oh yes, the most important one is the clock signal. This has to has this has to have a clock signal, which is located right here on pin six. Okay, that is either coming from the oscillator or the um, microprocessor. Okay, and that's used as the reference signal. Okay, so between the clock signal and the CS signal, okay, is what's going to be important to start off with, as far as the BCC. Okay. Now, unfortunately, on this particular TV, the EEPROM is not up under the T-Sync, it's located on the bottom, okay? So I just took all the screws out, uh, just some plug, which you don't need, you probably don't need this plug in here, this is going to the T-Con LWS cable, um, but I'm going to flip it over, and I'm going to put this on here to protect it, <laughs> right? You don't want metal touching metal, okay? And boom, this is our EEPROM right there, okay? Okay, so this is our EEPROM. The dot is pin 1, so we got pin 1 through pin 4, and then when we get to pin 4, pin 5 starts on the other side, right there at the bottom, all the way up to pin 8, okay? So the first thing that we're going to check, of course, quite naturally, is the VCC. Now, you probably don't have to do this, it's just a habit I do just to make sure... <laughs> because I blew up a few boards in my time <laughs> from uh, not having enough ground or one ground touching hot ground touching the cold ground so no big deal okay now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to turn the TV on okay I'm going to plug it in make sure everything's no, nothing's touching here you know, if you don't have this uh, ESD, man, you can use some bubble wrap or, you know, a big piece of cardboard or anything that's non-conductive and uh, separate that. Okay, I'm going to fire it up. Plug it in, I mean. I should see a white light. I do see a white light here at the bottom. Okay, it's booting up. Okay. to ground my meter and the first thing I want to check and see if we have any VCC going there which we should okay because the TV did boot up pin 8 
very top right hand corner. That's the voltage that we need for the EEPROM so it can start producing, right? I'm going to go to pin 8, okay, which is the top pin, top right hand corner. Okay, and as you see my meter says we well, have the 3.3 volts there, okay? So we do have voltage to our EEPROM, okay? The next thing I'm going to check is pin number 6, okay? Pin number 6 is the clock signal right here, CLK, okay? Do definitely want to make sure that we have a clock signal in there because if we don't, EEPROM is not going to function, okay? It uses the clock signal uh, as a reference to actually know how to read and um, write the data, okay? And so, I'm going to use my oscilloscope. Okay, I'm going to take my oscilloscope probe. I'm going to ground it to chassis ground. Okay, and I'm going to pin 6, okay, which is the clock signal. And let's see what I got here. I have a clock signal, okay. Let's stop it. So it looks like run. I'm going to hit auto. And as you can see, we have a delay, right? Or it's a high, and there's no information in the between there, okay? So, let's go ahead and run it. And that's basically what our clock signal looks like. And let's see the frequency on this clock signal counter. Here we go. And that is actually at 23 megahertz. Okay? Good. Get our clock signal. Now, I'm going to check my CS signal, which is located at pin 1. Okay? There we go, right there. That is pin 1, and it is at 69 kilohertz, or 70 kilohertz. Um, let me go to auto, so it's going to pick it up. There we go, okay. As you can see, we have our on, off, okay. Now, during this phase right here, um, this is the part where the clock signal also has a delay, and it also at those same points. So, as you can see right here, CS, the CS signal, okay, right here, and the clock signal are sort of working improportionately, right? When the clock signal has that little high or high with no information up under it, um, but when, I'm sorry, when the clock signal is, has that gap, Okay, this will also have a gap. The CS will also have a gap also at that same point. Okay, and when the CS on this particular one, it all depends on your on your EEPROM configuration also. But both of these have to um, be total, have to work kind of like proportionally. When that stops, this should stop or be on. When that's on or off, this should be just the opposite. Okay, so the way I'm going to do that to check that is I'm actually going to put my, use my, the other channel of my oscilloscope, the clock signal is on, and when it stops producing information, the CS signal should go off or on also. Well, let's just, you know, it's kind of confusing for me trying to explain this to you, but let's just visually see it on our oscilloscope so we can see exactly what we need to see. As we see, There on channel two is our clock input for the EEPROM, and on pin one is our CS signal. Okay, so as we can see, it is totally working. When the clock signal has the gap, the actual CS pin or the drive pin for the IC is actually off or on. But either way it goes, they must be in sort of a sync mode, as you can see right there. We hit auto, see so what's gonna happen if I do that. Okay. Alright. And we are 
both at 200 millivolts per division. Okay? Now, as far as I know, that seems like that part of the IC is working. All right. So that looks like it's working together. Okay? So now, what I'm going to do is check the input and output pin. Okay? So, if we look here, our data input, our data input is pin 5, okay, and our data output is pin 2. Okay, so let's go to pin 5 on the yellow, channel 1, and let's see what we get. There we go. Let's hit auto, and that's going at 277 kilohertz. Hopefully you can see that right here. Okay. So we do have something there. Let's hit auto. See what it brings us to. There we go. 277 kilohertz. And we are at 100 millivolts per division. And let's see. I can just make that a little closer there. And as you can see, we are getting something there. Now, let's go to pin 2, which is DO data output. As you can see, we have something. Okay, much bigger, bigger signal. And is actually this one is actually reading. The output is at 2.5 megahertz. Okay. There we go. Okay. And that's at 100 millivolts per division. We hit auto. And as you can see, that's what we have. Okay. Let's try them both. So pins two and five. Unfortunately, I don't have anything to clip on here because of the EEPROM, so I have to hold this with my other hand. And let's just hit auto. Okay, let's bring this in some. Okay. And as far as I know, we have 200 millivolts per division. And looks like we are getting input and output signal. And they're sort of doing something on the rising edge of the input signal. Um, we've got the output signal coming down like so, okay, and right, and so it's just, it's almost like just opposite of each other, but I thought maybe, you know, maybe that may be out of phase, I don't know. Okay, another thing I want to point out, I just found out, is that uh, that last test we did between the data input and output stages, um, the top one is the output and the bottom in the blue is the input and as you can see it's almost exactly opposite of each other um, I just read this some research on it and figured out uh, that it is the way it is supposed to be because it's reading data from the clock signal one is reading the rising edge of the clock signal and the other one is reading information off of the falling edge of the clock signal Okay, so let's scroll down. Okay, that's our IC. And that's just a different configuration of IC, same IC, just different pins. I mean, more pins. But um, check this out. It actually gives you a description of each pin. And right here, serial data input, output, additional DI input pin to, ser to serially write instructions, addresses or data to the device on the rising edge of the clock signal, okay? So the input, the DI, is writing instructions um, or address the data on the rising edge of the serial clock input. The output to read data or status from the device on the falling edge of the clock signal. So that's what the two signals look like. They were, uh, what do you call it, opposite or out of phase or whatever. They were just, just the opposite. One's falling, the other one is rising. Okay, so that seems to be okay. So I went ahead and changed the, the EEPROM, and this is what happened. 
Now, I did notice that when I put this EEPROM back under my microscope, um, the part number, I don't know where I got that 25W64 from. Probably another EEPROM I was looking at. Uh, this, is what, this is actually a 25L3206. E. Okay, that's the original EEPROM that's still in there. And um, I did check the pinouts. They're all the same. All the pinouts are the same. Ground, the clock pin, everything's the same. And the chip he sent me that I've got has a different part number on it. But it should be compatible as long as it's programmed correctly. So let me just go ahead and remove this chip. Okay. And put the other chip in it. This is the other chip right here. And I got a brand new. Okay, out of the bag. Okay. Let's just go ahead and remove that. I've already done this once, okay? Alright, so it's got plenty, probably residual flux on there for me to take this off. Shouldn't be that much work. Voila. Place on my mat. Take the other one. Make sure pin one is lined up. And there's plenty of ways you can do this. Trust me. I know someone's gonna leave me a thing in the comment. You, you didn't have to do it that way. You know, you could have did it this way. You could have did it that way. Well, hey, this is the way I'm doing it today. So, <laughs> anyway, I'm just gonna heat this up. Tighten up those joints. So we got a solder short there. No solder shorts. So I put my new EEPROM I've got off of eBay uh, back onto the board. Installed into the board right here. And as you can see, I just paused the last test that we had made from the original EEPROM. And this was the this was the input and this was the output. And as I was mentioning it before, one is one is low and um, one is rising and the other one is falling uh, simultaneously. And so I just paused it okay I'm just gonna turn that off okay so you see how that looked okay I'm gonna power my television power my TV up right plug it in okay so you get the white light white light comes on the bottom of the TV okay I'm gonna turn it on okay it is now on. I want to make sure that I got my VCC. Okay. Which is pin 8. Okay. Same as the other one. Even though there's a different part number. Okay. But let's see here. We should be getting. If I can see. <laughs> is it on? Hold on. Let me see. Let me make sure I turn this on. I was to forget that. Okay, it's on. Round my meter. Oh, it's on hold. Okay, I hate this meter. Come on. Okay. And I should be getting 3.3 volts. Get 3.3 volts. Okay. TV is on. Okay. And that's on the VCC pin 
pin number eight. Okay, now I'm going to take my scope. We are 200 millivolts per division. Okay, I'm just going to show you that that's working. And I'm going to put that on the data input, which is pin five. Absolutely nothing. All I get is a rise in DC voltage. Nothing. Okay? So, I'm on the same settings as far as um, seconds and volts per division that I was when we had the old signal. So, that should come up, but it's not coming up. Okay? I want to check my clock signal, which is pin six. Nothing. Okay. What's going on here? Okay. Nothing. Put my meter on. Just hit, hit auto on the scope. Okay. So like it's like it's something that's trying to come up there, but it's not. Okay. It should have been very um. That should have been very notice, noticeable. Am I, am I on the way here? Okay, that's, that should have been very predominant as far as as far as our clock input signal coming from the microprocessor circuit. So that's nothing there, or it doesn't look like an old clock, and it's only at one kilohertz. Okay, all right, and let's roll our CS signal. Pin 1, CS, looks almost like a clock signal, let's see, okay, and let me go to the output pin, which is pin 2, okay, those look all the same as the data signal, um, and of course that's, let's go back to our clock a clock pin. C OK, that's clock. Nothing. Okay. And I've done this twice already. Okay, and so I did the EEPROM, the original EEPROM, I did put that in there again and rechecked it and it checked the same way it did the first time I checked it before I took it out. This is my second time putting this in, and when I put this chip in here, I get nothing. And I was just, you know, just assuming that it was a problem with the clock pin, okay? Because without the clock signal, um, there's nothing else for the EEPROM to work off of. It's not going to work, period. I mean, you can have VCC, but if you, have, you don't have a clock signal or a good clock signal uh, going in, uh, it's not going to work, okay? So, what I did, actually, I actually drew a diagram of the EEPROM, and I did some resistance checks, okay, on the pins, you know, after I unplugged the TV, of course, and I did just uh, not not uh, I didn't put it on. I, didn't use, I know it says dial, but I just put it on regular resistance, not dial. Okay, and leave it the same way I got it plugged in right now. Okay, I just unplugged the power, put my meter on the dial, put my meter on the resistance scale, and this is what I got. On pin one it was greater than 200 mega ohms. It was infinite. Okay, pretty much. Okay, that's our CS pin one and also pin six. Well, the only ones that were infinite, okay? Uh, it says on my meter greater than 200 mega ohms, okay? And the other pins, besides ground, which of course was zero, were about 8.2 kilo ohms. And of course, the VCC was exactly at 3.9 kilo ohms, okay? Okay, but with the new one, the new EEPROM, okay, I put in, which is the one I have in right now, I did the same resistance check. The only thing that was different was the clock pin, pin 6 to ground, was reading exactly 2 mega ohms, okay? And let me zoom in so I can show you on my meter. Okay, so I'm going to show you on my, on my meter, okay? I've got my meter in just regular ohms. Okay, I'm going to ground my ground lead to the chassis, the metal chassis. Okay, 
because my main board is still grounded. Okay, and I'm just going to show you right fast. I'm going to go to pin one, okay, which is reading mega ohms. Okay. All right. And go back there. That is the CS pin. TV is unplugged. Okay, power is unplugged. And I am getting big ohms. Okay, uh, anything over 200 megs, uh, I don't think this meter is going to read. Okay, and I'm going to go to pin 2, which should have been 8.2 kilo ohms on the other E prime I see. Okay, and as you can see, it's 82.5, or it was fluctuating, so 8.2, 8.5, close enough. And then I'm going to go to my VCC, which is pin 8 at the top right. Okay, that should have been 3.9 kilo ohms. Okay, there we go. Now I'm going to go to my clock pin, which is pin 6 for the clock input. And that is reading 2.8 mega ohms on here, okay? The other one, the old IC, the original IC, the one that was working, was reading the same thing as pin 1, the CS pin. It was infinite, over 200 mega ohms. So that is obviously our problem. Two things for, two things for certain, one thing's for sure. Either the guy sold us a BS EEPROM, that was incorrectly programmed or I had the wrong EEPROM okay so um, obviously if that clock pin pin 6 is not getting the correct clock signal uh, the rest of the IC would not work because the input output and the CS operates off of the clock signal so there's no clock signal regardless if you have the VCC the 3.3 voltage going to the IC uh, the IC is not going to work. So this IC, maybe because the part number is different, uh, but it's not. It's either uh, it's either doing something with the clock. You see the uh, clipping the clock signal, or it's uh, pulling on it, or something, and it's not coming up uh, to work the IC, or it's not made for that particular frequency of a clock signal, as far as the IC is concerned, or it's, like I said, it wasn't programmed. Okay, so this is the actual EEPROM that I bought off of eBay right here um, as you can see it's for my TV P502 UI-B1E now my main board uh, is a little different from this one okay I didn't really look at that but this is just the board number this 715 G6924 dash M0F 000005K uh, that is actually just, just the board number. That's the board that is pre-printed on the board at the factory. And then whatever model or, or whatever model TV, whatever features it has, it just adds components or, you know, or deletes components. I'm, I'm sorry. It adds whatever components it needs. And they use, like, the same board for different types of different models of t televisions. Okay. So, because the actual board number or part number of the board would be on a barcode sticker. This is the number that's pre-printed on the board. So, I really didn't go by that. But as I scroll down, I checked it again. Okay, this is the same board number right there, 50K. Okay, my board number is actually 715G6924-M01 instead of F. Okay, 000, and mine, the last four is 005T instead of 5K. Okay, same one, U. 2002 on the bottom that's the location okay and I check my panel number my panel number is the exact same panel number right here nothing shit no no different letter or, or, or number or nothing okay only okay so hmm so I did I did some more research and I found this one just putting in my actual uh Oh, I, my actual board number, I did write that down also. Um, it's XECBOTK00430X. Uh, okay, they don't have that, that barcode, the number, they don't have the number that's on the barcode sticker on the main board on this seller advertisement.
So um, that's kind of weird. So I actually did put the put, put my part number in, okay, um, which is right here. Which one was? I think it was his first one. This is from the same seller, but it's a different EEPROM. Now this one actually has the actual part number. This XEC B zero T da 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 forty thirty X EEPROM. Okay, and okay, and the only the same board number, I believe. I'm not sure. Uh, yes, that the last four does says 005T, as in my board number. And so I scroll down. Okay. And it says that this EEPROM only works with Inlux, Inlux T Con board. Okay. Let me see if I can, oh, I can't spread it out, but that's what it says. It says it only works with the Inlux T Con board. Okay. So I check my T Con board. And that's the one I have. So I'm going to order a e -prom. I'm going to order this EEPROM. Okay. And I want to do another video, part two, and see what happens. Okay. So the main thing I want you, just want you to get from uh, you, you get, you want you guys to get from this video is basically how to check the EEPROM, what to look for. The main pins are the clock signal. You definitely get the clock signal, which in our case was, was what, what, what the problem is, uh, evidently. We need the VCC and we need the data input, output, and the actual CS signal. Okay, all those signals work off the actual clock signal. Okay, guys, and like I said, you can always pull up a data sheet on it and see the specs on it. You don't need a schematic for troubleshooting things like this. So always check it first, and then we get your new year prom. You know, just use a scope. If you don't have a scope, just invest in you a nice oscilloscope and check it. Okay, all right, guys. Well, hey, guys, I appreciate you watching. Uh, make sure that you do subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos. And I will see you in the next one. Big Dog out.